I'd like to welcome you to the Baseline to Baseline podcast slash show. It steps to success rather than failures. But you know, it seems like right now it's just not working. You've never seen a centre like him who could do the amount of things that he can. So I think uh, the Celtics probably are the ones to beat if they all stay healthy. Hello, good day. Welcome back to Baseline to Baseline with Alistair Albert. I am, of course, your host, Alistair Albert, bringing the Caribbean to the world via the NBA. That's a slogan. That's all you need to kind of remember. It's very catchy, isn't it? Should be able to remember that. <laughs> um, so we're here right back, um, you know, talking basketball once again. The NBA is now into its second round of the NBA playoffs for this 2023-2024 season. And it's been such a, a great amount of games that have played, you know, with some predictable outcomes and some that were a little bit surprising, but a lot of injuries uh, playing a part in this playoff so far as well culminating in quite a lot of stars and superstars being sent home really early. So we're going to get into that a little bit where I kind of go through my bra- my bracket that was shared on Baseline to Baseline on Instagram at Baseline to Baseline 2, Baseline 2 digit, Baseline UK. Uh, you could uh, follow me there on Instagram. I shared my bracket there uh, in a post a couple of weeks back. So we're kind of just going to go back and see how good I've done, good or bad, that I've done in this in this post, uh, predicting what I thought the brackets will end up being like. Um, do a little bit of predictions. We have, we're we getting on, on into the, the second round right now. And I think, you know, of course, it's really good to kind of give a little bit of a predictive analysis as to what I think might happen in some of those games. And also we're going to do the usual bases of the week and a lovely footnote section as well, where I kind of bring back another shoe from the past, which will be returning this year which was a really futuristic shoe that came out back in mm, I'm not going to give it a date just yet I think I'm going to just wait for you to kind of see but it's going to be a lovely shoe that kind of represents and kind of pays homage to one of the teams that have progressed to the second round in these playoffs so we're going to go straight on off into it okay so I'm going to put up the bracket uh, really soon for you to have a look at and see kind of what I was predicting in the first round of these playoffs and let's go left to right looking at the screen right now at the bracket we're going to have a look at the first uh in the top left uh series that we had between the Oklahoma City Thunder and the New Orleans Pelicans. Now, this one was a little bit of a weird one. I like what I will say here really uh, early on is the predictions that were made were done before the playoffs and with the presumption of health. So we kind of had some sort of sort of feeling that you know teams and players will be healthy to a point, or players would be returning into these playoffs. Um, you know, allowing their teams to have to be at full strength at some point. But that didn't necessarily happen with this first example. As you see, the Pelicans getting swept by the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, you know, uh, Shea Gil- Gilgis Alexander was outstanding in this series again. Um, 27.3 points, six rebounds, five assists. Um, you know, a little bit of shade under his regular season numbers for this, this series. But, you know, of course, he had guys like Jalen Williams and Chet Holmgren, of course, uh, who I was really complimentary of uh, in my uh, uh, my previous segment where we were speaking about uh, Shade Gilgis-Alexander and his MVP chances. Of course, the MVP uh, vote has not come out as yet. I still believe it's Nikola Jokic, but I have been making a case for... Um, you know, Chet Holmgren being actually more of the centerpiece, the X factor for the Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City Thunder. Of course, uh, Shea Gil- Gilgis Alexander is the scorer. You know, he is the one who's probably likely to get the most looks. But I kind of have a different look, um, um, I, uh, argument to that. So if you haven't seen that argument, go check out episode 16, last um, the last uh, episode uploaded to Baseline to Baseline. I kind of give my full argument there. Go into the section, the description of the video on YouTube. You could just click through to the section where I speak about SGA and his MVP chances. So the, the Oklahoma City Thunder, oh my goodness, the, I have a little bit of tongue twister stuff going on here tonight, but it's okay. We'll, we'll get through it. So Oklahoma City Thunder, like I said, um, swept the New Orleans Pelicans. We had a very bad showing from the the stars and the the Pelicans, um, no one averaging over 
20 points per game in this series. And, you know, we're in an age right now in the NBA where scoring is, is premium. You know, guys are scoring over 20, 25 points a game very easily in this league with the, of course, the influence of the three point line and guys kind of just concentrating on that and getting to the basket as well. A little bit of, um, you know, stepping away of the, the mid range, which some teams want to kind of bring back. But, you know, you know, the, the game is wide open right now. Lots of three point shooting and high scoring games. Um, but, you know, no one was able to muster a 20 point per game um, production in this series, which kind of just put the nail in the coffin for the Pelicans, basically. Zion Williamson, of course, was injured. He himself, for the regular season, he had played the most games that he has he has in his career in the NBA. 70 games played this season, but he wasn't able to suit up at all for the Pelicans in this first round, and that kind of really put themselves in, in, in a hole for this season, basically. Um, I actually believe if Zion was playing this, this series, and, you know, his energy and if he was actually healthy throughout this series, I think this might have gone the other way. I think I would have had Pelicans in six, but knowing that Zion was not going to be um, available, you know, it was kind of easy to kind of say that, you know, the, the Thunder probably would have had this. I did not predict a sweep. I thought they would have won in six games, but I think they just handled their business and they did what they had to do. Um, so my initial prediction of Thunder in six was wrong, but I did have them advancing, as we could see here in the bracket. So, you know, kudos to them. Uh, they had the best defensive rating in the playoffs, but I, I think that's actually a, a false-ish stat to kind of look at. If you have to look at what the Thunder did with the Pelicans, letting them only average 89.5 points per game this series, you know, that's actually, well, defense. Yes, of course, defense has a lot to do with it, but the CJ McCollum, um, uh, Brandon Ingram, uh, um, and the rest of the guys, uh, Jonas Valanciunas and all of them, were just not able to put up enough points. Um, and I don't think necessarily that's just the Thunder defense, but just their futility in not being able to produce kind of helped put that situation uh, where they were just lacking points going up on the board. So 89.5 points per game in this series was just not going to cut it. And a sweep, of course, in, 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 this, in this day and age with that point production was inevitable. So kudos to my team, the Oklahoma City Thunder. They now advance on to the second round to face the Mavericks, who are the fifth um defensive racing in this playoffs but we'll come to that in a little bit so moving on to the second one that i want to talk about we speak about the suns being swept by the timberwolves they also own four it was ridiculous i actually predicted for this series the, the numbers aren't on the brackets but i'll tell you what i thought i thought the wolves would have won this series as well but i actually thought it would have been a lot closer i predicted the wolves would have won in seven games they got the suns got swept and we, of course, had the star turning of Anthony Edwards, who was just outstanding in these, this series, averaging 31 points per game, eight rebounds, 6.3 assists, two steals on 51.2% shooting, 43.8% from free. Up in his up in his average in these postseason, um, from 25.9 points per game, uh, 5.4 rebounds and 5.1. So he had you know, increased production across the board, Anthony Edwards did. And, you know, he was just awesome. In game four, the closeout game, he put up 40 points, nine rebounds, six assists. And, of course, he had the dunk of the playoffs so far. If you haven't seen, seen it, look at the highlights here right now. Uh, two, point, um, two minutes, 14 seconds left. The Wolves up, uh, are up 3-0 three, three and oh in this series. You know, this is the last few minutes of the Sun season, you know, and they're trying to battle it out. You, you know, the, the score was 113-111, um, as you can see on the screen here. And Anthony Edwards just went up, took the corner, got onto the baseline. Kevin Durant tried to help on defense under the rim, and he got posted absolutely posted and this was the dunk i think that just announced not that we needed more announcing for anthony edwards because he showed this throughout this whole 
regular season that he is here. But I think this dunk announced him as being, you know, the next heir apparent for the face of the, for the, of the league. Like I think many people have been speaking about. I have mentioned it in, in, in certain uh, recordings that I've done. I've done so on Sportsmax in my last um, appearance on there as well. That Anthony Edwards is just ready for the smoke, or ready for all the smoke and ready for the show, you know, that he's ready to give. So we're going to see what he does next up against the, the, the Nuggets. But, you know, he just, you know... He, he stamped the card, he put the nail in the coffin in the Suns, and, you know, beating his, his you know, his childhood idol, idol of Kevin Durant, uh, who averaged 26.8 points per game this series on 42 minutes, you know, trying to play as much as he could. Frank Vogel, you know, really tried to push these guys, but, um, you know, they, there was just not enough. Bradley Beal had a horrendous uh, showing in these playoffs. Stephen A. Smith even said at one point that, you know, he showed up as the Wizards Bradley Beal in this series, um, although the Wizards Bradley Beal actually put up quite a few points in his heyday as well. But he he just came out, you know, just hor horrible. Nine points, one rebound, two assists, six turnovers, and fouling out in game four, that closeout game. Um, it was, you know, really sad to see what they did um, you know, and, and coming up really short as they did in this series. But we're going to talk a little bit about them a little later on in the show um, because I've, I've had to include them in the beaties of the week. But I'm going to talk about a little bit about that in a little bit um, from another angle. Um, and the Suns, of course, are sent home. Kevin Durant and uh, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal now could plan their vacation um, choices with their families, etc. Uh, moving on to the Mavs and Clippers. Of course, this was another game, another series that I thought would have been really competitive. It was disappointing in the in 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 you know in to say the least in terms of having people out there on the court that you thought would have produced at a rate that you'd expect for their their cachet and their status in the league. Kawhi Leonard, of course, was absent in the in the closeout game. And, you know, haven't tried to give it a, a go um, in game uh, games two and three of this series. You know, he was a no-show for the rest of the series, uh, game four, five and six, where he was not able to play because of knee inflammation, which has been bothering him throughout the, for, for, for quite some time now, for some, for some years, throughout his whole tenor, tenure um, with the uh, Los Angeles Clippers. But yeah, they, they came in, we had some, some games where it looked like, you know, they were going to kind of really give the Mavs some trouble, but they just were not able to put it together. Um, we had Luka Doncic, of course, just going crazy, averaging 29.8 points um, per, per game, 8.8 .8 rebounds, 9.5 assists, almost a triple-double, but he was shooting, you know, really bad from the, uh, from the three-point line, 24%, only 24%. But Luka Doncic was, you know, outstanding. Kyrie Irving was equally outstanding. He himself averaging uh, 26.5 points per game, 5.7 assists, 5.7 rebounds, 4.7 assists, um, and just shooting outstanding. 51% from the field and almost 45%. Derrick Jones Jr., you know, playing some defensive um, um, positioning and, 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 and support there to try to kind of keep, keep, uh, or try to contain guys like Paul George um, and Kawhi Leonard when he played um, and James Harden and you know it was it was it was really a bad matchup for an injured uh, Los Angeles Clippers who had high hopes you know this is the last season that they will be having uh, sharing the buildings with uh, their building the crypto.com arena with uh, the Los Angeles Lakers they're moving now to their lovely facility in the Intuit Dome that Steve Ballmer has uh, has put his his money and finances into and he wanted to go into this next season with their rebranding and a new uh, arena in this new area Inglewood Calif uh, California Los Angeles um, and they were just not able to kind of give the the the, the momentum that they needed going into this season uh, into next season of course now you have a, a roster that's now going to be really in flux and not many people knowing what to expect from these guys because they went out in such a disappointing fashion uh paul george is is waiting to decide on whether or not he will uh, accept an extension from uh, the Los Angeles Clippers, James Harden is on a one-year deal. We don't know what's going to happen with him. Russell Westbrook, you know, he was also on a very short-term deal. You know, will they bring these guys back into Inglewood and kind of give them another chance, a fresh start, if you will, in a new arena with, a, with not a new fan 
base, but you know, a new a new locale and maybe some new faces coming in and wanting to adopt these guys as their team. But um, you know, it, it's it's crazy that um the Dallas Mavericks were able to handle handle them, you know, so um efficiently um putting them out in six games. And of course, we what we could say the, the turning point for the Mavericks is for this season, of course, was the trades that were made at the trade deadline by Nico Harrison, bringing in Daniel Gafford of, um, from the, the Washington Wizards and P.J. Washington, who had never been in this situation before, playing in Charlotte, where he's on a team that is, that is basically there to contend. People were w- kind of wondering whether or not he will actually be, be able to transition into a solid player on a contending team. And he's done that. You know, he didn't really average too much this series, just 10.8 points per game, but he was kind of like an enforcer. You could see, you know, lots of the videos where um, Russell Westbrook um, was, um, you know, kind of drawing at uh, Luka Doncic and P.J. Washington came in and, you know, stood up with his arms folded and, you know, was able to get some, you know, good camera time and some uh, photo ops from that situation where he tried to separate, you know, and kind of show Russell Westbrook, no, 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 you're not going to mess with our boy, Luka Doncic. And, you know, he came in and he was a bit of an enforcer and, you know, all that energy and, you know, their ability to score as they were able to um, and their new de- newfound defensive capabilities, um, even, you know, carry over and Luka Doncic kind of putting in that effort as well to get past the, 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 the Clippers, you know, just push them through. And, you know, good for them. You know, these guys are going to be a force to be reckoned with. Reckoned with, they were actually one of the people I call the dark horses in this in this uh, in this uh, uh, season. You know, I had the Golden State Warriors initially as one of those teams. I thought if they could get it together, everyone would be in trouble. But we had, of course, all of the, the issues with Draymond Green and everyone else, and you know, just they were not able to put it together. But the next dark horse for me was the Dallas Mavericks, especially after they did this trade. Um, and, you know, they were able to prove it in this first round. Moving on uh, to, to, to to play, who will they be playing? We'll, we'll come, come to that in a second. Um, but, yeah, they're going to be uh, really interesting to see how they progress in this uh, playoffs. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, an Eastern Conference bracket quickly. Um, the New York Knicks and the 76ers. It was amazing to see the New York a crowd, the New York fans having something to really cheer about and even traveling really well to the Philadelphia arena, um, taking over some seats in that arena, much to the sh- the ch- to, to the tri- chagrin of um, Joel Embiid um, and, you know, the Philadelphia faithful who wanted to cheer their team on, but they didn't come out in full numbers. And, you know, we had a, a, a game where the New York crowd was just, you know, immense in in the city of Philadelphia. I remember it was game three when they moved over to Philadelphia. I was watching the game and I turned my back, you know, I wasn't around for the the start of the game, you know, tip off and everything. And I was just hearing the game in the background because I was in another room while the TV was on. And every time New York did something, which I could hear from the commentators, I was hearing this New York crowd and I was like, what's going on? No, 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 this this game is in Philadelphia. Why does it sound like the Knicks have at, at, at home? You know, the crowd was just as loud when a Brunson shot was made or a defensive stop was made by OG Ananobi or someone. And I was like, wait, 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 I, I need to go check this out. I went back to the TV. No, yeah, they're playing in Philadelphia, but the New York crowd just traveled and, and really upset Joel Embiid, you know, he called them out about that. The ownership group even tried to buy tickets so, you know, you could prevent less, you know, could, could, could make sure that less Nick fans took up seats in the arena. Um, and it was something to behold, but Jalen, Jalen, uh, Jalen Brunson just continued to dominate this, uh, this, this year, you know, and this is why I say he, supp- he should have been in the, um, MVP conversations even last year and he's definitely in this uh, this year in, as one of the top five guys. Early in the game if you admit Knicks trying to go to the second round in back-to-back years. Brunson fires cut next in anticipation of the ball extending the possession for the 76 or excuse me for the Knicks. DiVincenzo got a three and that was huge. Jalen Brunson leads the NBA right now in playoff scoring, averaging 35.5 points per game. And he's just been outstanding. We had, you know, that amazing game five where they were about to close out the Sixers and, you know, he just went off 
And but of course, Tyrese Maxey coming up big and saving the season for the Philadelphia 76ers. And it was just a, an awesome game to watch. I even tweeted, I showed a, the, a little picture here of a tweet that I, I was writing. I was like, you know, the New York Knicks being in a position to win. And, you know, you know, they just being this good. It, it feels so unsettling to me. I can't believe that, you know, they're actually this good right now. Um, and I and I tweeted, you could see it here, you know, it's a little bit unsettling to me. And then as I was about to send that tweet, you know, praising Jalen Brunson as well, Tyrese Maxey hit that logo free to send the game to overtime. And it was crazy, you know, it was just such an amazing game to watch. Um, one of the most exciting games of this postseason so far. And of course, they beat the 76ers in six games. Joel Embiid, of course, putting up a valiant effort with 33 points, 10.8 uh, rebounds per game. Of course, this was a game that we all kind of got the information that he had Bell's palsy. We saw his eyes, you know, you know, one eye blinking, the other isn't. Um, and, you know, he was just trying to not be a distraction um, after game two, I believe it was, keeping his head down so the media and the cameras couldn't see what was going on. Um, and he just tried his best alongside Tyrese Maxey, who himself averaged 29.8 points per game, um, 5.2 rebounds and 6.8 assists. And, you know, they, they, they tried their best, but it, it just wasn't meant to be, um, you know, just too much um, injury concerns for Joel Embiid. You know, he was out for quite some time before this series, before the playoffs started. And everyone wondered, you know, if he, if he would be at, a you know, 100%, um, would he be able to play, you know, a, a, a tough, tough, drag, dragged out series with, the Knicks and you know he at least statistically shown he was able to do that but you know it just wasn't enough uh for uh them to win what I really want to call out as well here in this 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 series and what has been really important to see for the Knicks route this this season was the play of Josh Hart Josh Hart actually averaged in this series 16.8 points per game and 12.3 rebounds right shooting 43.2 percent from three-point range now why i want to call this out is josh hart has been playing power forward for the new york knicks ever since julius randall went down he has been inserted into the starting lineup and he has been their power forward but he's the guy who could play guard and you know shoot threes and everything like we just saw here with his percentage and he's just been amazing um, looking at basketball reference, <laughs> looking at the page, you know, there's there's the page where, you know, you have the player, their picture, their name, the date of birth, and nicknames associated with this player. And one of the names on there was Josh Barkley, of course, kind of mixing his name with Charles Barkley, being an undersized guy himself in his time, you know, leading the league in rebounds and everything. And Josh Hart has basically been that type of person, um, you know, undersized 6'4 guy, I believe. And he he just, since Julian R Randall went out, he's been crazy. So to start the season, right, um, he started only six games, Julius Randall, in the, in the lineup. And up until the 29th, I think the last game was the 27th of January this year when Julius Randle last played his last game. Up until that point, when the calendar flipped to 2024, the 27th of July, 27th of January, 2024, Josh Hart averaged 7.3 points per game, 6.5 rebounds per game, and 2.7 assists. Without Randle, the rest of the season, the rest of the, the regular season, without Randall from the 29th of January to now, not just to now, to the end of the regular season, actually, he's upped his averages from 7.3 and 6.5 to 12 points per game and 10.6. But now going into the postseason, you know, he's upped it again. Like I said, 16.8 rebounds and 12.3. And he's just been outstanding you know he's the guy who's literally been running through the wall from for for for, for tom thibodeau um there's a, a crazy meme out there which he responded to and had a laugh where you know this guy gets this full head of steam and he just jumps over a bridge into into some deep water and that's exactly what josh hart has been he's the, he's been the guy who has been happy to jump into the deep water alongside jalen brunson leading the new york knicks to a remarkable and tremendous first round win uh, for their team advancing uh, to play the Indiana Pacers in the second round. Um, the Miami, Celt Miami Celtics 
a series, Miami Heat versus uh, Boston Celtics, you know, that one was one that was easy to, to call. Um, but of course, like I said, when I predicted this series, I was hoping that Jimmy Butler would be available and Terry Roger. I thought the, the Celtics would have won this series regardless, though. I, I thought they would have won in six even with the Jimmy Butler and Terry Rose in, in tow. But, you know, they went out and gave the gentleman sweep and won this series in five games. Of course, the game that uh, Miami won, they had to do it at a historic rate, hitting 23 three-pointers led all the way by uh, Terry um, Tyler Hero and the rest of the squad hitting, you know, this uh, franchise record amount of threes. Um, and they were just not able to sustain it. They were only able to average... Um, 92.2 points um, this postseason in this first round um, where Bam Adebayo, of course, was leading the charge of 22.6 points per game, 9.5, 9.4 rebounds. Tyler Hero was the next person on the on the list uh, from this roster, hitting 16.8 points per game. Um, and, and, yeah, it just wasn't enough from there. Caleb Williams was next. Caleb, um, Caleb, yeah, Caleb, what's his name? Caleb Williams um, was next on the on the line on the on the team hitting eleven point six points um, and Jaime Hackers, you know, who only played four games in this series, I believe, um, averaging twelve point eight points a game. If you don't have at least two twenty point per game sto- scorers, as we saw with the Pelicans, you're not going to go very far in this playoffs. And of course, things slow down, defense gets tight. You know, your team starts to understand your tendencies and, and, you know, you don't score as many points. But in this day and age, you still need scoring. And um, Bam Adebayo, you know, valiantly um, given the production that they needed, but it just wasn't enough without uh, Jimmy Butler and uh, Terry Roger. Duncan Robinson, who, of course, is is, is known for his three-point shooting, um, only averaged 2.6 points this series and 23% from three. You know, so he was absolutely no help to the Heat. And, you know, this saw them lose a series very easily uh, to the Boston Celtics, who now await um, the winner of uh, the Orlando Magic and Cleveland Cavaliers series. Indiana and Bucks. Now, this one was, as you can see from this bracket, I was being really stubborn. I was being absolutely stubborn. I really thought that um, the Bucks with Giannis Antetokounmpo in tow um, would have beat this team. I thought, you know, there was enough juice and enough um, um, disgust and, and some competitive juices being flowing from the in-season tournaments and all the games that were lost to the Indiana Pacers during this regular season that the Bucks would have pulled through and won this series. I had them winning in seven games. But of course, the Indiana Pacers are the, the, the league's um, highest scoring team this year. And um, the Bucks, I, I, you know, everyone was saying, Stephen A. Smith and others were saying that, you know, the firepower of the Indiana Pacers and how quick they get in transition would kind of leave the Bucks in, in a lurch and they, they probably wouldn't have won the series anyway. And they proved to be right. I was being a bit stubborn. I thought Giannis being there would be able to, to help them. Um, but of course, Giannis didn't play at all. He had a calf injury um, where, you know, the team decided to try to manage that because we've seen what has happened to players who have had calf injuries, non-contact calf injuries, turning into, you know, something a little more dangerous for them. Uh, we saw it with Kevin Durant, who, of course, was started with a calf injury um, so yet, some years ago at Golden State and then that turning into a torn Achilles. And the Bucks didn't want that to happen at all. So um, they decided to rest him for this first round and that just created issues for the team. Um, even though I, I thought, you know, they probably would have been, you know, a little more competitive um, and pushed this, this series, you know, into a seventh game and probably still prevailing um, with their experience and the high-level superstar guys on that team. But it just wasn't to be. Um, Patrick, uh, Pascal Siakam, Miles Turner and Halliburton were just able to do do it all for this team. Six players were um, uh, average double figure double figures for this team. So Siakam, Miles Turner, Halliburton, um, Andrew Nembhard, um averaging thirteen point eight points per game. Obi Toppin twelve point uh, three, and Aaron Neesmith with 11, 11 points. And even T.J. McConnell coming off the bench, he averaged. Uh, nine points, five points, and you know had a crazy closeout game. Av- averaged, uh, or he put up at least twenty points. 
um, in that closeout game against the Bucks, uh, where he and Obi Toppin led the team in scoring, putting out the Bucks. Um, and it was just, you know, no Giannis, no dice. You know, you're just not gonna, you're just not gonna progress if you don't have your main player in there. And and yeah, that's what happened to them. So that was that. These were those teams. And now we move on to this one is an interesting one because this is you know still ongoing. We're going to see a game seven on Sunday, May the fifth. Um, over over here, it's uh, approaching that time right now. I'm doing this recording in the evening, and um, yeah, we we we. It's it's really surprising that the Cavs have actually allowed the Orlando Magic to come into this series and push it to a seventh game. Big respect to Paolo Banquero and Franz Wagner, Wagner, who um you know just have been outpacing um and playing absolutely well. The youngest team in the playoffs this season, you know, doing their thing. Um, Paolo averaging twenty five point two points per game and Franz Wagner twenty one seven rebounds each for them, and they've just you know just pushed this 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 Cavaliers team who are now missing Jared Allen who hasn't played the last two games games five and six um, because of a rib contusion um, and you know probably a little bit of a smart move by the Cavs there as well because although they wanted to end this series early hopefully giving him those two games rest will allow him to be in a position to help the team the Cavs close out the magic on Sunday in game seven. So, you know, whilst he hasn't played for the last two games, I do anticipate Jared Allen coming in to try to help save this season. In the games one and two of this series, when he played, um, you know, both um, wins, the, 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 the Cavs went up 2-0 early on in the series. He averaged 16 points and 19 rebounds. You know, someone on the boards like that who could kind of put you know, get his hands up and get those rebounds, give you more possessions, is such a big key to this team. And 19 rebounds, and yes, those 16 points as well are very helpful, you know, to uh, Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, and Mobley. And, you know, hopefully he could come back for Game 7 um, and he will be able to provide these guys the lift that they need. I actually uh, predicted the Cavs in six in this first round. That, of course, hasn't happened. Um, and, you know, Donovan Mitchell has a little bit of a bad history um, where, you know, he, he he's put up points, um, crazy amounts of points and lost games. Donovan Mitchell, since 2017, is the sixth, is this has the, is the sixth most player or the player with the six most 40 point games with losses at least 40 points games with loss. He's doing that at least three times. 57 points against the uh, the, the Denver Nuggets in uh, 2020 in the bubble, you know, where he was going crazy with um, Jamal Murray. 57 points in game one of that first round series they lost. The 50 points that he scored last night in game six against the Orlando Magic, they lost. And 44 points in that same game um, same series against the Nuggets in 2020, uh, where he lost as well. He has the six most appearances on a list of guys who have had 40 or more points in a series in the playoffs um, uh, since 2017-18 when he was drafted, basically, and, you know, have losses uh, to that. So it's it's crazy to think that, you know, sometimes his outstanding production and, you know, um, elite scoring production sometimes doesn't lead to wins but of course in 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 all time in the from the time he's been elite in the league and playing in the playoffs he or anytime he scores 40 or more points his teams the Utah Jazz and the, the Cleveland Cavaliers are, are, are two and three basically so now he wants to even that that record out have another 40 point game because I think it will demand another 40 point game from from uh um uh Donovan Mitchell or, you know, the presence of Jared Allen and a very balanced scoring attack from these guys, at least three of them having to score at least 20 in this game or just an outstanding production from uh, Spider Mitchell, um, 40 plus in a win to get these guys to advance past the Orlando Magic because they've shown the Orlando Magic, they're, they're, they're not here to mess about and it's, it's crazy that they're, they're here pushing these guys, these, these veterans um, into a seventh game. But hey-ho, this is where we are right now. This is the season of the emergence of new stars into this league. 2024 is the turning, turning 
turning point, I think, for the lead, league in bringing in the new generation. And the Orlando Magic definitely want to have their say in that. So, um, of course, the next uh, uh, first round series that I didn't touch and I will not touch is the Lakers and the Nuggets. I think that has been beaten to death. LeBron James and, and Anthony Davis are, of course, sent home um, in five games, um, you know, and, you know, let, let them get some rest. They want to play on the Paris um, Olympic team this year. So probably, you know, having the opportunity to rest early would do good for them and America, the American team. Um, so I'm not going to get into the Lakers. I think we've, we've, we've heard too much about them over this season and their struggles. So I'm not going to get into that. So very quickly to end this little segment here about my past bracket and predictions, I will say that um, looking at the Oklahoma City and Mavericks who are now playing in the second round, I kind of give the Mavericks the edge here. I see Mavs in six for this. I think uh, the the additions of Gafford, um, Lively playing really well off the bench, uh, PJ Washington, and just the scoring prowess of Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving are just going to really cause problems for the Oklahoma City Thunder of course. The Mavericks actually have the fifth best uh, defensive ratings in this playoff so far. So wh- wh- why would I think that the Mavericks would do any worse than the Pelicans who have, um, you know, a, a better a better defensive rating and two dynamic, more explosive stars who are definitely going to score close to 30 points a game between the both of them and really give these guys trouble. I think the size as well between Gafford and Lively, um, Derrick George Jr., um, and uh, P.J. Washington will give Chet Holmgren a little bit of trouble, I believe, especially Gafford. Um, Jillian Williams will have to step up really big for the the, thun, the, thun, the Thunder. Um, of course, this is this team's, you know, first foray into the second round, um, being the best team in the West. But I think the Mavericks have what it takes as that dark horse to progress and beat the Oklahoma City in this this series. So Mavs and six for this one. Um, the Wolves and the Nuggets, I think this is going to be a really exciting season series. Anthony Edwards is going to continue to show that, you know, he's ready for everything. But in saying that, I still have the Nuggets winning in seven games. I think this is going to go the distance. The Nuggets are going to be outstanding as well. Jamal Murray has shown, you know, he's ready for anyone who wants to step to him and score points. We saw that, like the example I gave there with Donovan Mitchell playing against these guys in the bubble, going toe-to-toe with Jamal Murray, putting up 50-point games, and Jamal Murray actually equal in that or doing better um, and, you know, the person on the other side. And Nikola Jokic, you know, has a habit of just putting triple doubles up really quietly and impacting the game in a way that, you know, you just can't really stop. So I think the Nuggets and their championship experience, Michael Porter Jr., uh, Kentavious Caldwell-Pope, are going to be very instrumental in this series as well. Um, Aaron Gordon, definitely, you know, his size will be really useful in this series as well and his uh, ability to, you know, be a lob threat and hit some corner threes here and there, will put the Nuggets over the top of these um, Timberwolves, who will have to, at times, hide um, Rudy Gobert and him being a bit of a a, a defensive liability when being brought out of the zone. Because once you start to bring him out of his, his comfort zone, in the zone, playing help defense, you know, you kind of expose him a little bit. Nas Reed will be a very big factor in this series, uh, for the Timberwolves, but I think the Nuggets still, with their experience and their championship me- championship medal, will move forward and win in seven. The Indiana Pacers and the New York Knicks, I think this is also going to be a very exciting series. Fast-paced uh, game, you know, guys scoring lots of points in bunches. The guards, Brunson, um, Hart, who is not really a guard now. He's more like a forward, power forward type of guy. Um, Dante DiVincenzo, Miles McBride, the guards, and 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 Pascal Siakam on the Pacers. Tyrese Halliburton, Nemhard, um, and, and Aaron Neesmith. This is going to be such an, a remarkable series to watch. Uh, Isaiah Hartenstein has, has filled in perfectly and remarkably since the Randall injury and Mitchell Robinson went, went down. Robinson, of course, is back. But how are they going to actually contain and step out outside to mark Miles Turner? This is going to be really interesting to see. 
I think I have New York winning this series, though, in seven games. I think uh, the the momentum of Jalen Brunson and what he's been able to do, the superstar turn or the star turn that he's taking this, se this season and into this postseason will continue. And I think Stephen A. Smith's prediction of them getting to the conference finals is actually really possible and plausible. And I think they will be able to do that getting past the Indiana Pacers. Um, the Boston Celtics are, of course, still waiting for uh, the winner between the Cavs and Magic. Like I said, Game 7 game seven happening tomorrow, May 5th. I think the Cavs will pull this out, and I think it's going to be really important that J Jarrett Allen plays this game. If he plays this game, Jarrett Allen, the Cavs win. I believe so. Um, I think Donovan Mitchell is, is not wanting to be in a situation where he disappoints and be put out by the youngest team in the playoffs right now, um, or one of the youngest teams. And um, I think the Cavs are going to pull this out. But despite that, their, 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 their gift for winning against the Magic will be playing against the Boston Celtics who are getting lots of rest right now and getting ready for this series. And I think Boston, regardless, will win in six, whether it be Orlando Magic or the Cavs coming through, I think the Boston Celtics will win in six. So that's my my those who I think will progress. The Mavs, the Nuggets, the New York Knicks, and Boston moving on. So now we are at the conference final stage. And I think if we need to kind of go on into predicting into the finals, let's do that really quickly. I think against the Nuggets and Mavs on the West side, I think Nuggets will win in six. I think the size of Nikola Jokic, his playmaking ability, Jamal Murray going toe-to-toe -to -toe with guys like Kyrie Irving and, and, and KCP trying to, you know, put, put some defensive clamps on Luka Doncic, which will not really happen but we'll see how much he can make him be inefficient and take him out of him, his game a little bit. Um, I think the Nuggets will kind of push through again and get back to the finals. Nuggets in six for me in the Western Conference Finals against the Mavericks. Um, and also um, on the East side, we have the Celtics, I believe, coming against the New York Knicks, who I think will win in seven games against Indy, like I said. And this one is going to be really interesting because we have a situation now where Kristaps Porzingis is not playing, he's injured, right? And he is he hasn't been in the lineup, and it has been said, uh, it's been re been reported by um, yes, Yen, a ABC reporter, who, whichever affiliation that he is with. Chris Haynes has reported that it's probably likely that Kristaps Porzingis won't play in this second round. And, you know, Al Horford is definitely a, a, a serviceable big man who has been there with this Celtics team and could probably hold on the fort for these guys. Um, so I think it's going to be really interesting, though, because if Chris Tapps Porzingis is not in this lineup, I actually, I don't know if I could say this, but I actually think the New York Knicks have a really good chance of pushing, pushing the Celtics to a seven game, seventh game. I don't know if I want to go too far and say the New York Knicks will beat the Celtics, but it will put it will be pushed to a seven game, seventh game if Kristaps Porzingis isn't in the lineup um, and be able to to get past. Um, um, if if Kristaps Porzingis is in the lineup. I believe the, the Celtics will win in six or seven games. They're about probably probably six, um, but depending on the health and the the, the momentum of Kristaps coming back and whether or not he's healthy enough to move around as he is and play at the level that he has throughout the season, uh, this could this could end in six. Um, but you know this is this is a health dependent series on Kristaps Porzingis. So Celtics and Nuggets get to the finals, and you know what? I have the Nuggets in seven. I think it's gonna be. Um, like I have on my brackets here, you could see I had it from the start of this this preseason. I think the Nuggets will repeat, and whether they play the uh the the Boston Celtics or if the Knicks could actually go crazy and win that that series against Boston in the Eastern Conference Finals, I think regardless of what it is, the Nuggets are going to raise the Larry O'Brien trophy trophy again this year. If they play the Knicks, they're going to win in six. Um, going to give them give them you know at least two games could go in five as well I believe. Um, but the Nuggets will repeat as champions this year of the 2023-2024 season. So that's my bracket update and predictions. So you know going on into the second round when this episode comes out, of course we'll kind of be deep into the second round. But you know I just want to make sure I kind of provide what I thought will happen in this series. So that's that's this uh, for the moment. Um, speaking about 
what has happened and what will happen, I believe. Uh, and I'm, what I'm going to do right now is going to take a really short break to kind of get past this segment. Um, and, you know, just stay with us. Stay with me right here. We're going to get on into some really in, uh, interesting topics um, coming on after uh, this little break. So stay, stay right up. Get, um, get your, your water, your, your, your drinks, your snacks, and come back and listen to what I have to say on uh, segment two of Baseline to Baseline with Dallas Bob. All right, everyone, welcome back to segment two of this episode of Baseline to Baseline. Of course, it's still me, Alistair Albert here. I'm the, well, I'm the only person doing Baseline to Baseline. My name is on... My name is on... On the show. You know, no one else is kind of doing it for me. I don't have... You know, this is a one-man band. You know, I, I'm the only one doing this. So, uh, it's, of course, me again, Alistair Albert. Um, and, of course, now, what I want to go into here really quickly before we get into the Beatties of the Week section and the footnote is just really let's just let's reflect a little bit here we have um the playoffs going on right now of course we're heading off into the second round like i mentioned but we really need to take time and i know t- the tnt guys do this and they do their you know gone fishing section and everything but we let's take a look back and really think about the guys who were in the playoffs this year and who are now out of these playoffs, right? So, you know, just thinking about the superstar losses that we've had this postseason, we have, you know, from the Heat, we had Jimmy Butler who hadn't played. Um, you know, would people class him as a superstar? I'm not really sure. He's probably on that cusp of or that borderline between star and superstar. But Jimmy Butler leading his team to the finals twice. I think, you know, he probably has a little bit of um, you know, credibility in being able to say that he's a superstar. Um, he's the main guy of the Heat, and he wasn't, he was, he's not there anymore. And of course, Bam Adebayo, who's a star on this team, um, them not being able to progress. The Bucks, of course, like we said, losing um, Giannis Antetokounmpo for the postseason and him not being able to play at all this postseason, um, of course, and the, the free agent acquisition of Damian Lillard coming from Portland. Um, you know, going out in this postseason. And it's it's crazy, man. Just just look at this list, you know, Giannis, Dame, Jimmy, the 76ers just lost with Embiid and Maxi. Maxi, of course, is not a superstar yet. We need a little more longevity there, but he showed this year as an all-star, first-time all-star, and what he was able to do in game five and push this team. Um, and probably having to be the leader of this team moving forward because of all of the injury issues with jo- Joel Embiid. You know, you know, it's it's a shame that he is no longer playing in these playoffs. Um, then of course the Pelicans, the Pelicans are gone. Uh, they were well. They were gone from this, the time the series started. To be totally honest with you, Zion Williamson, you know, has not played at all this postseason. And coming from an outstanding game where he played, um, you know, uh, and uh, on a season where he played seventy games, this is the most games he's played in his career in the NBA since being drafted um, from Duke um, University. And he played thirty six minutes in the play in tournament game, that seven eight game against the Lakers. And, you know, he put up his 40 points, 11 rebounds, 5 assists. And he was just, you know, a man-child out there. He was playing with force. And he he tried to will his team to a win until the last few minutes where he got injured. And he could tell he was absolutely frustrated, you know, walking off the court. Um, you know, absolutely disappointed because he kind of felt he was injured, um, you know, after having a remarkable season. Um, so yeah, it's the, the Pelicans are with uh, without Zion. The, the, the league doesn't have Zion progressing in these playoffs, and it's of course sad to see. Um, CJ McCollum and Brandon Ingram did not play like stars at all, so it's not even worth rec- mentioning them in this section. Um, but Zion Williamson, you know, not being able to play this postseason was crazy. Um, the Clippers, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, who of course only played two games in this six game series, James Harden and Russell Westbrook, who had a really um, um, deficient uh, showing in this postseason, only averaging, I'm going to tell you in a little bit. He only averaged Russell Westbrook 6.3 points per game this postseason, 4.2 rebounds on 26% from the field and 23.5, right? 23.5. 
um, percent from three-point land, um, getting ejected in one game, of course, because of that little issue with Luka Doncic and, you know, um, behaving a little bit badly on the court. Um, he, he had to be put out. Um, and yeah, the, the Clippers, who I thought were the ones who were going to contend with the Nuggets this season, like I said in, in, in my last episode on, on Baseline to Baseline, my, one of my, my, my pre-recorded episodes, um, I said, you know, the, the Clippers were one of the teams, you know, it was absolutely Jekyll and hyde where, you know, they looks like they, they found their championship stride at one point in the season, going 25 and 6, I believe, and then they lost that same stride just as quickly, you know, starting to lose games and the defensive efficiency just starting to go and tank basically and coming into this postseason Kawhi Leonard not playing of course he played the most games this season um, since uh, the 2016-17 season with the Spurs he played seven um, 68 games this season Um, you know the next highest amount of games played was 74 during that time with the Spurs Um, and you know despite him playing that amount of time this season, you know, he just wasn't able to push through and he wants to play in the USA team this week, this season as well. And yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if he can recover for that and play for the USA team um, when he wasn't able to kind of stay on the court for his own team this postseason. Um, and yeah, the Suns, KD, Booker, Beal, you know, I kind of spoke about them in the last episode as well. It's just a bit disappointing what's happened with this team. We'll come to them in a little bit in the basis of the week section. And of course, the Lakers, LeBron James and Anthony Davis. And we still have, you know, such a lot of, you know, refreshing superstars in this league still playing in this postseason. Uh, Jason Tatum, of course, and Jalen Brown. Um, Christoph Spazingis, we're waiting to see what's happened with him. Derek White had an outstanding series. Um, you know, this first uh, first uh first uh, series in this postseason and you know let's see if he can kind of uh, keep it keep it going you know he, he showed out against the Miami Heat and you know let's see what happens and of course Drew Holiday who has been really quiet this postseason um, you know and this season of the Celtics but he's kind of just using his energies in different ways for this team um, but he's kind of been really quiet but you know he's still in the Cavs of course um, between the Cavs and the Magic Paolo Ban- Banquero Franz Wagner and Donovan Mitchell are still in there the Pacers um, Halliburton Siakam New York Brunson Hart OKC uh, SGA Chet and Jalen Williams um, the Mavericks Kyrie Luca uh, Wolves, Anthony Edwards, the superstar to be, Carl <laughs> uh, Anthony Towns, Ru- Towns, Rudy Gobert, and Jokic and Murray from the Nuggets. You know these are the guys still in, but the the heavy names, superstar, longevity names, Steph Curry. Well, he didn't even play in the playoffs this year. LeBron, KD, um, Giannis. You know these are the guys who are out of this postseason, and it's really remarkable because, like I say, and I want to make this point in this part of this segment here. You know we are turning a new leaf in the NBA, and we're starting to see that emergence of new talents coming in. We saw it happen with. Um, Tracy McGrady and Kobe Bryant and Allen Iverson when you know they were starting to get um old and kind of kind of not be the masters of the game anymore and then we had to kind of bring in guys like uh, Dwayne Wade and uh, LeBron James and all these guys coming in afterwards Chris Bosch um Carmelo Anthony you know these guys took over the league so that was the transition then and we've seen the transition now and the stars who are still in right now these guys are definitely going to be the ones carrying this league forward along with guys like Ja Morant who has who actually was um injured this postseason as well the Grizzlies were just horrible this season um but Ja Morant as well let's not forget him he's going to be someone to watch moving forward so uh so yeah I just wanted to call out let's just do a little bit of a reflection you know who's in and who's out and you know just kind of thinking about where the league is at right now this is definitely one of those points in history where we can kind of see the departure of some some of the older guys and the the emergence of the new 2024 I think is that season where we start to see you know these new guys starting to dominate the league all right and now we're going to go into my favorite section of, well, one of my favorite segments of the show, <laughs> the Beatties of the Week section. Of course, I've, I haven't done a, a, an episode for, uh, for a couple of weeks. So this is just going to be an encapsulation of some of the different things that have come up. Um, 
the three ones that I'm going to mention are, you know, really important, but I, they have a few things that I want to just kind of see. They were on the outside looking in. They didn't make the top three for this one this time, but Tobias Harris in that last series against the New York Knicks, what happened, man? And that last game where, you know, he just went totally silent, being paid $39 million this season on, on an expiring contract. We definitely know he's going to be out. So um, Tobias Harris, there was a, a thing that happened um, with uh, an interview that Draymond Green did with Clay Thompson, where Clay Thompson was um, talking to Draymond Green about his importance to the team, but didn't necessarily admonish him as he should have. Of course, you this is your teammate. You wanted to kind of keep things easy and all of that. But I just thought, you know, that interview went a bit awkwardly without Clay being a little more of who we expect him to be in that straight talker. Uh, you know, I'm telling Dream and you know, come on, man, you need to you need to do better and everything. But it was just all soppy love, love hearts and rainbows talking about the importance of Dream and Green, which we all know. But I think someone needs to step up and talk to Dream on and no one is doing that. Clay didn't do that there. Donovan Mitchell, of course, that 50 point game losing to the Orlando Magic in game six. Um, you know, this is a playoff disappointment. I mean, we just have to hope that doesn't happen in game seven. Um, Darvin Ham being fired. I think everyone is talking about this right now. Who's going to be the new Lakers coach? Um, we it's it, it's it, we, it's yet to be seen. There's Coach Budenhauser out there. People are even talking about GG Reddick because he has this podcast with um LeBron James. He's been interviewed by the Charlotte Hornets in there for their position as well. So GG Reddick might be a coach of the Lakers. Who knows what happens. And um, yeah, so these were the outside looking in ones. But the three bases of the weeks that I'm going to go through really quickly here because I want to make this a really short episode. I've gone on really long already. Number one, the Suns. Matt Ishbia, the new owner of the team, you know, coming on after the team was eliminated and being swept uh, by the Minnesota Timberwolves, saying that, you know, this team is inches away of contending. You know, we were just swept, but don't worry, you know, this team is going to come back as is, basically. And uh, not sure about Frank Vogel, which I think is really good. You know, get rid of Frank Vogel and bring someone else, maybe get Coach Bud, uh, you know, in to kind of um, move this team forward a little bit. But he thinks, you know, this this is uh, this team is just inches away from being able to be contenders. And I think the, the team constructed as is, like I said in my last episode as well, no point guard um, and just, you know, the offensive sets that Frank Vogel will, was running. If this team has to kind of come back as is, there's no way they're going to be any better than what they were this year anyway. Yes, there'll be a one more year together, but I still don't think they're going to do what they want to do is and win the championship. But what I want to say here as well is, so that's Beatty's, what Mash Ish- Mash Ishbia was saying. But I want everyone to kind of just go back a little bit and think about 2012, where the Oklahoma City Thunder were in the NBA Finals. And after that season, when they lost in that, in that finals against the Miami Heat, Nike put out some really cool, but really weird ep- um, um, campaign for KD. And, and you know, the whole strap line was KD is not nice. You know, KD was really, really upset at being second place to anyone. That same season, he actually came second place to LeBron in MVP voting. But, you know, coming off the, the, the finals appearance, you know, KD was a bit frustrated and was like, you know, I'm tired of being second to everyone. You know, he was considered the second best in the league after LeBron James. He was drafted second in the league, in the, in the, in the NBA draft after Greg Oden. He was tired of being second place. And KD said he was no longer going to be nice. Right. And, you know, I think we need a little bit of KD not being nice next season and being a leader for this team. So, you know, whatever Nike did for that campaign, they need to revisit that. And Kevin Durant himself, you know, of course, Nike's probably not going to recycle a campaign in that sort of way. But Kevin Durant needs to kind of revisit K- KD is not nice from 2012 and be a lot more of a leader of this team for them to progress. But, you know, this is not the basis of the week for this one. Matt Ishbia is the, is the nonsensical part of this and who said the foolishness about this team is about inches away. He's kind of becoming like Jerry Jones for the Dallas Cowboys, you know, if you watch the NFL. Jerry Jones is always on the mic, you know, always willing to talk to reporters and say, you know, we, we, we're just, we're all in, you know, we're, we're just a, a piece away. And then they always disappoint. Matt Ishbia is a new owner in the NBA and he's already starting to sound like Jerry Jones. You know, the few times he's speaking on, on, on 
press conferences, he kind of sounds like one of these owners who just sounds all really giddy and excited. But you know, just you know, you just kind of feel like he's going to be continually humbled because he's a, just a little bit too exuberant. That's how Matt Ishbia comes across to me. And I hope, you know, they're able to kind of construct this roster better to be more competitive last year. But they also, in that new construction, KD needs to use this offseason and reconstruct himself and come back with a little more flair and energy and being KD, not nice. <laughs> Betty is number two. Moving on swiftly, we're going into um, James Harden. Man, James Harden, the no-shows. The no-shows are just ridiculous for James Harden. And, you know, he has these moments in these playoffs where he comes up and he's big, you know, he scores some huge games and everything. And then games where you really need him to step up, especially closeout games or elimination games, when you expect him to step up, he just goes completely, he disappears. He goes completely cold. And this is exactly what happened this year again. In games one to four in this series against the Mavericks, James Harden averaged 26, point, 26 points, four rebounds, seven assists on 54% shooting um, and 50% from freedom. The, 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 that series was, was two and two during those four games, right? James Harden played well, he produced. Game five and six, how much did James Harden produce? 11.5 points, 5.5 assists, 10 5.5 rebounds, 10 assists. Now, you can see what happened there. He started to be a little more of a facilitator and become less aggressive, but 11 points, right? James Harden, for the Mavericks for the Mavericks to have beaten the Clippers, it needed a James Harden who decided to go cold in the last two games, and that's what he gave them right there. So he, he was 1 of 13 from three-point range, and 7 of 28 from the field in those last two games. And, you know, he's shown that before. In Philly last year, when he 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 went out, he, he went crazy. He went en fuego in games 1 and 4, scoring 45 and 42 points um, for Philly, the, Philly last, last season. Um, you know, in game 6 and 7, he... Game 7, the closeout game, he only scored 9.6 rebounds and 7, seven assists. You know, and and again disappeared in in a, in a in a series where they were actually trying to advance, costing Doc Rivers his job as well. So in those two games, last two games, again he averaged only eleven points, six point five assists, eight um, six point five rebounds, eight assists, shooting twenty five point nine percent from the field and nine percent from three point range. Right, James Harden seems to have this habit of kind of trailing off and disappearing. And, you know, he was able to do that there again, you know, in, in that Philly, Philly series. And, of course, the last one was when he was in Houston 2017, 2018 against the Warriors. You know, that, that classic game seven with a chance to get to the NBA finals. You know, he and his team, though he actually scored a lot of points there, 32, 6 and 6 in that that um, that, um, that that series, that game, sorry, that game seven. You know, he shot two of 13 from the field, 15% only. Um, and the team went 27 missed shots, setting an NBA record or tying an NBA record for futility in three-point shots, you know, and losing to the Golden State Warriors, who, of course, then went on to um, the finals. James Harden, man, you know, you, you've, you've created a reputation for yourself where people don't know what to expect from you at the biggest moment. You come into the Los Angeles Clippers was where I thought you would actually do what you, you are capable of doing. Coming from the situation from Philly, you being really upset with Daryl Morey, you saying that, you know, he's a liar and will not play for someone like that. Los Angeles being the team, the Clippers are the team you wanted to play with. And, and show everyone that you are ready and, and you can still be that superstar. You didn't necessarily need to do too much because Paul George and Kawhi Leonard was there. Kawhi Leonard was actually injured again. and It was your time and you folded, right? So James Harden for me is Beatty's number two. It's, it's really, really sad to see someone who we know is so capable just come up so small in the biggest moments. And of course, you know, he's an NBA player. I'm, I'm just a guy watching, but it's, 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 it's difficult to see someone like him with the capabilities that he has, has not produced in the biggest moments. And, you know, that's what fans of the games, you know, are, are, are obligated to say. Um, and as an analyst as well, you know, you came up short, man, you came up short and it's, it's, 
really sad to see. And Beatty's number three is something that I've been lamenting and I've been speaking about all season long. Brad Stevens at the trade deadline, off season. Can you get someone else to back up Chris Stamps Porzingis, please? Can you get someone else on the bench who can uh, who could produce in case Chris Stamps Porzingis got injured, please? Chris Stamps Porzingis not being in this lineup is going to jeopardize the Boston Celtics championship this year. What do you do where that's concerned? Because you know he's not someone who's very durable. He played quite a lot of games this season. But, you know, you just know something is not going to be right with him at some point in time. And it happened to them again at the worst time, you know, in the postseason right now. Playing as many games as he did uh, throughout the regular season. And now in the postseason, you don't have him. You know, he played um, a couple of games into the, 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 the first round. And then now, you know, he's probably not even going to play the second round. And hopefully the opponent that they play doesn't really give them much resistance. But not having Kristaps Porzingis is definitely going to be a detriment to the Celtics in their unfinished business revenge tour, wanting to win a championship and probably having to go against the Nuggets where you need that size. You all did not pick up DeMarcus Cousins. You did not pick up Dwight Howard. Hassan Whiteside probably would have been a, a, still a really good player to have as someone off the bench to provide defensive capabilities and sides. I think he just retired. You know, the Celtics, I think, really dropped the ball on this season as, as the season where they have a chance to do as much as they could. Jo- Joel Embiid is now out and was out of and out of the postseason. Um, Jimmy Butler and the Miami Heat, the thorn in their side is no longer there. Um, the Milwaukee Bucks are also out. Giannis Antetokounmpo, all the injuries that have happened. You guys could continue to skate through the East, but once you get to the finals, having a, a, a gimpy or non-existent Kristaps Porzingis on your team is going to put you guys in trouble. And that's why I said in my last episode that the Celtics are on a road to heartbreak because if they lose again in the Eastern Conference Finals or the Finals this year, they're now staring down a salary amalgamation of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum with contracts that will probably be worth at least $600 million, right? What are you going to be able to do to fill out your team? Given Drew Holiday, of course, um, uh, an extension recently, Derek White will be up for his really soon. Um, What's going to happen? How are you going to fill out this roster? So I think Brad Stevens, once again, I'm calling you out this for, for, you know, the lack of foresight as an executive and not getting someone in on that bench to kind of help produce. Sam Hauser, Luke Cornett, Peyton Pritchard, they've all done really well. I'll, I'll, I'll give them that. In the absence of Kristaps Porzingis, when, you know, he was injured and these guys needed to step up, they hit freeze, they, they assisted, they played efficiently, and they played creditably in their roles as backup people. But no one is going to respect these guys in the postseason. And getting a bigger name who could actually provide size and production, missing out on that is your fault, Brad Stevens. So that's BT's to me, right? So this is the BT's of the week um, for me. Uh, the Suns and Matt Ishbia, you know, just being a little bit too Jerry Jones-ish for my liking, you know, talking about this team is just inches away and they're not. So Matt Ishbia, number one. Number two, James Harden just coming up small again in this postseason. It's really disappointing to see someone who was a former MVP and who could put buckets up, you know, just come up so small again. And Beatty's number three, uh, Brad Stevens, Trader Brad, as I called him at this at the, the, the preseason, you know, not doing what I, I thought he would have been smart enough to do and getting another backup for, for this 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 bench up for the Celtics and then a person like the Marcus Cousins and Dwight Howard not being picked up will definitely hurt them as they continue to progress in these playoffs with an injured and often injured Christoph Spazingas. Stay right up. I'm going to be bringing you the footnote section of this show um, and coming right back, you're going to see a lovely shoe that kind of turned quite a lot of heads uh, back in the day. Stay right, stay right with me. We'll, we'll talk about that soon. Okay, everyone, and welcome back to the final section of this Baseline to Baseline podcast, video podcast show. 
Um, and of course, this is the footnote section. This is where I kind of do a little bit of a spotlight, sneaker spotlight, bringing back a shoe or speaking about a current shoe um, that I actually have in my collection. And I thought it would be really good to actually speak about based on, you know, just what's going on and, you know, re-releases, et cetera. So this one is going to be an ode to the New York Knicks. You know, the New York Knicks, as I said earlier on, is going to be the shoe is going to be an ode to 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 a team that has progressed. And it's the, definitely the New York Knicks. The New York Knicks have a feel good about them right now, which is amazing. You know, they haven't been, you know, into the second round with this amount of momentum and confidence since when? 2000, was it 2014 with Carmelo? And Mike Woodson and and these guys, I, I might get the year wrong when they when they won their first series in such a long time. And before that, it was 1999 when they it was a lockout shortened season and they reached to the finals with Latrell Spiriel and these guys. Um, so the Knicks behind Jalen Brunson and Josh Hart and Dante DiVincenzo and Coach Tibbs and OG Ananobi and all the guys, um, you know, have been re doing really well. So I wanted to bring up a shoe that was Knicks related. And of course, originally was not made for anyone from the Knicks, but a Knicks player was the one who had it. He had a a, 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 a player excuse, exclusive edition to the shoe. And this shoe is actually coming back this year, not this Knicks version, but the model is actually returning um, this season, well, the, towards the end of this season or this year, um, you know, to all its glory. And today, I would like to bring back and talk about the Flight Posite, Flight Posit, Flight Posite, however you pronounce it, Flight Posit, Flight Posit, Flight Posite, the Flight Posite one, <laughs> right? This was a shoe that dropped in 1999, right? When this shoe came out, the original colorway, the gold colorway, which you're going to see on your screen here, which is actually going to be re-releasing um, in the holiday season of 2024, this gold uh, futuristic shoe that was on the cusp of the Y2K era. You know, we were all talking about our lives going to be changing remarkably with um, the year 2000 coming up, coming along, the new millennium. You know, the new millennium is going to usher in, you know, future, futuris, futuristic stuff, technologies, etc. And this composite um, cladded shoe named the Flight Poseid came out and it was just crazy at the time. You know, it, it's it, it, just look at that gold shoe again. I'm going to put this up on screen again to you and imagine, you know, 20 plus years back this shoe being released and it it was it was just crazy to see i remember you know being at secondary school st mary's college and you know one or two of the guys coming on court with it and it was like yo that iridescent gold got kind of fluctuates between gold and green and purple it was just the most amazing thing to watch and it was like nike just you know elevating its game in terms of innovation and looks and style and you know that's what the flight per site was this edition actually is the same or similar version that alan houston of the new york knicks wore when they went to the nba finals in 1999 the only difference with this one is that it's not the pe the edition that had the number 20 his jersey number on the top so if you look at the um example here with alan houston wearing them and some um, signed versions that were online. You know, this is the exact same um, silhouettes, the same color, um, you know, NYX orange and blue on there. Um, and this one, you can't really see in the lighting, but, you know, it has this pearlized um, tint to it. So, you know, you look at it in certain angles and you can kind of see this little blue pearl, pearly, blue tint on it and it is, it's just a, a really amazing shoe and you know when these shoes came out like i said in 1999 it was just crazy it was part of the alpha project um from nike um so the five little dots that signified the alpha project back in the day um you know it's still here on the tab um and you know when this shoe came out during the all-star weekend of 1999 you had guys like tim duncan kevin garnett jason kidd um, and all these guys wearing it and it was you know like the new thing it was the new shoe that was being um, shown off by Nike um, you could see here Nike flight systems foam per technology the shell of the shell 
um, upper, you know, being the foam side bit. And, you know, there were so many remarkable col colors that came out. Of course, Penny Hardaway, who is um, another favorite player of mine. He's my third favorite player of all time. You know, he wore versions of this shoe as well, um, PE versions. And, you know, the guys that I mentioned as well, Kevin Garnett and everyone, like I mentioned, you know, and later on, there were other colors that came out. So we have this uh, dark neon blue color that came out as well. Um, and, you know, this just hits right. It was meant to kind of, um, um, replicate or bring back some memories of the foam per side one in that black and dark neon blue colorway. Um, and this, of course, goes really nice with my shirt. Actually, um, this hits really right with you know the Nike swoosh, um, the Alpha Project um dots at the back as well. Um, and yeah, just dark blue. That's that just looks really cool. So this shoe is coming back. I think an all black version and also is dropping at some points in the year, but the gold colorway, the initial color that dropped to the public in 1999 is the one that's going to be, um, I think the one everyone wants to kind of go for um, when it releases in the holiday season of 2024. So look out for the, the fly per sides when they do release again from Nike, they were, they were 160, I think at the time when they retailed, um, back then in, in $160. I'm not sure what it's going to retail at now. It's probably going to be over 200 for sure um, as a retro. Um, but, you know, look out for these. You know, these were such a, an amazing shoe when they came out. I'm really happy I have these in my collection, especially this Knicks colorway. And like I said, I'm paying homage to, oh, you know, the old Knicks, Alan Houston, Latrell Spira, Larry Johnson, and these guys who got to the NBA Finals, uh, you know, and this shoe being on Alan Houston's foot was like, whoa, that's cool. And, you know, not this vision coming out again, but fly per side, Nike, just do it. <laughs> All right. So this is the end of this episode. Um, baseline to baseline with Alice Alves. I'd like to thank you again for watching. Um, you know, we went through all of the playoff stuff and thinking about what the predictions will be moving forward, the beaties of the week, like we said, and also the fly per sight, Nike Air fly per sight um, of the footnote section. Thank you for watching. Uh, the next set of episodes coming up are going to be interview based, most likely. I'm going to have um, a lovely um, discussion with someone um, from St. Lucia and also an association from the Caribbean. I will not kind of let you know who is, who is, who is going to be just yet, but you will see the promos for that on YouTube and Instagram eventually. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to those interviews. So stay, stay tuned to those like and subscribe, subscribe, like and subscribe to the pages on YouTube um, and Instagram. Uh, on Twitter, if you if you want to follow, just search my name or baseline to baseline on Twitter or and on TikTok. TikTok is a new thing for me. Don't have many followers in there, and I want to kind of get that up. But um, you know, just follow. You, you, you're gonna get some good content from me. So thank you very much for watching, and let's go. Let's see what the second round is gonna hold for us, and we'll talk about that as things progress. Uh, have a good evening, and once again, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> Bye.